started then. So good, uh, good morning, folks in North America. Good afternoon if you're in Europe, and good evening if you're in uh, in lovely Asia today. So uh, my name is Phil First, I'm the CEO at HFS Research, and I'm joined today by a couple of my colleagues, Elaine and Christopher, leads a lot of our emerging tech or research, and Joel Martin, a recent addition to our team, um, based in Canada, lovely Ottawa, which is a lovely warm part of the world at this time of year. Uh, Joel Martin is our, is our Vice President for Cloud Strategies. And joining us is a special guest, Jamie Dobson, who for his second appearance with us, who's the, uh, did a podcast recently with, with Tom Reiner. But he's the co-founder and CEO of Container Solutions, uh, which is an emerging native cloud startup and um, has a lot of exciting things going on. And um, he's not sponsoring this. He's here. This is all fun. This is a non-sponsored, unfiltered conversation. So do feel free to add any questions you have or try and get to them if we can today in your panel. I think most of you at this point should know how to use Zoom. If you don't, you where have you been in the last year? Um, and send you a few questions and see if we can get some good debate going today. Because uh, we're talking a lot about... Um, the lovely cloud appeared about a decade ago. And then in a, I went to, up to our blog in 2010, and all we talked about was the cloud for about the whole year. Then, then it kind of morphed into a smack stack, which was social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. And that became something called digital. Um, but I think 10 years on, uh, we're now forced into the cloud. And, and my colleague, literally, Elena, came out and just inadvertently said the problem with the cloud is um, that we all need to go cloud native, but no one's even barely started yet. So, um, you know, we've had 10 years of thinking we're in the cloud and really the 80, 90% of our stuff hasn't been. So we're, we're making that move, we're making it fast. So we're gonna talk a bit about um, the industry where it's going, what is cloud native? I haven't figured out what WTF means yet. So if anyone does, please enlighten me. Um, how does automation fit into the cloud conversation? Because they are symbiotically aligned, uh, automation and cloud. And, and then um, how do we start this? How do we stop this? Where does everything go with data and progress? And then how do we start addressing the symptoms of the problems that we're facing today? How do we, how do we actually get some progress and move forward in the, in the crazy market that we're in? Um, uh, so I think... The, the, uh, the key today is that everything starts and everything ends with data. Uh, and, and the strategy really is to refine it. Uh, that's where we're headed with a lot of this stuff. It's, um, it's about getting the data to win in your market. It's about rethinking uh, the processes to get that data. I mean, data is the strategy, whether you're, whether you're looking to improve your supply chain, whether you're looking to um, get data to get smarter than your competitors, uh, whether you're looking to be operationally faster and more efficient, uh, direct costs out the system, it's all about data and it's all about how do you design process to get to that data? How do you um, not only design the process, but how do you do it in the cloud? Well, you've got to get into the cloud. And you know when you look at um, things like RPA today, you know, a lot of these implementations are still on-premise. They're still stuck in little silos in, in departments within companies. They're not fully integrated. They're not operating in a true three-tier three web architecture where you can have people working uh, together across the world on elements of data process uh, development and design and that sort of thing. So you've got to get your stuff into the cloud. And when it's in the cloud, you've got to automate it, right? You, if you haven't automated your data in the cloud, God knows what you're doing, right? So you've got to automate your data, you've got to do it in the cloud. And once you have your data automated in the cloud, you can then do lots of cool things with it. You can actually um, align different flavors of AI and engagement AI to get to that data so you can be effective with what you're doing. Um, it's about applying um, different types of tools and tech to get smarter and keep refining that data to get smarter and more focused all the time so this is a on constant ongoing cycle and most companies sit literally at the beginning you know, we're literally at this how do we actually stop doing things the way sap told us to do in 1983 um, how do we actually do a bit more than what we did last year where we were forced for the very first time to move 
um, processes into a work from home situation where we could actually operate. We had our customers and our employees working in this wonderful digital duality. And we call this often the one office. And how does this, uh, how does this really impact the businesses? Because one office, it's about three things. It's about auto native automation. It's about people and process. It's about data and decisions. Um, it's about how do we look at the employee experience and, and make that part of the customer experience? You know, the billions of dollars that got spent on enabling our customers to interact in a touchless fashion, to have much more real-time personalization, to use what we used to call the omni-channel effectively, to have much more customer-driven process design. How do we really embed that into our employee experience as well so um, we can build out that digital infrastructure to really build a scalable, agile, work-from-home, remote digital business um, where data is secure, it's borderless, um, it's unified, right? It, and, and it's automated. But this is this is the nirvana, right? The, the one office is a mindset. It's not it's not a framework. This isn't like a rigid architecture on how you need to build out your next stack. This is a framework on how to be truly effective as we develop. Um, how do we augment our workforce? How do we start to wrap the needs of our customers into everything that we do across organizational lines, right? How do we turn our finance folks into the arbiters of data within the organization? How do we build out a mindset of inclu inclusiveness and diversity? And how do we align outcomes uh, across the organization to be effective? You know, we don't have these inputs anymore where it's all about nine to five jobs. This is about um, how do we actually be effective with the outcomes of our people and what we do? When we understand the fact that I think only 37% of companies are gonna return to the situation they were in pre-COVID, you know, the world has shifted. Things have really changed and we need to change how we think and how we operate. And if you think that 90% of the global 2000 have, um, you know, all their staff still for a lot of these businesses working out of their houses, working remotely, um, companies have, many have come out and said, we're no longer a a, you know, a, a, a office-based company. We're a work-at-home business. So I think we've seen Amazon, Microsoft, Unilever, Google. We can go through all of them. They're now work-from-home organizations. They're not going back to the way things were. They'll, they'll have, sure, they'll have some offices, but less of them. They don't want to keep spending on this corporate real estate. They don't want to keep spending on the crazy amounts of travel that they were doing uh, pre-COVID because we're used to working like this now. You know, So, so things have really shifted in terms of how we want to operate, you need to be much more scalable, data-driven, uh, process-driven than ever before, and outcomes-driven. This is where it's all going, because ultimately, the more you can anticipate the needs of your customers before you, they may even know what those needs are, the more successful you're going to be. And that's what this is really all about. It's about being anticipatory. It's about, it's about um, orchestrating in a way that we really hadn't thought of before. And we'll talk a bit more today about our emerging one office tech platform. Um, this is about um, looking at the different uh, portfolios of technologies that are going to make us successful. I heard the term best of breed today for the first time in a very, very long time. But it's true. We're no longer in an era where we want to have everything rammed together in, in, in one stack in one, in one um, platform, in one suite that has lock-in that you can't move from. We want to have that ability to get the best sort of data tools that we can acquire, the, the best of the one office applications that are truly cloud enabled like Cooper and Salesforce and even some of the cloud-based elements of SAP S4, right? Um, we need to take the best of RPA. Elena will go into that in more detail in terms of that stuff can actually get legacy systems working effectively in the cloud. If you do it right, it enables you to move stuff around your company faster and quicker than you've ever thought thought possible. Even if it's a Band-Aid, Band-Aids are good. Ring fencing legacy is great. It means you don't have to spend $50, $100 million on that next complicated in, you know, implementation. No one's got time for that. No one's got the money for that. We need to move. We need to think fast. We need to think way beyond people and process and, and also think about how do we change faster? How can we design think better? You know, there's 
we're now seeing some very interesting global design thinking packages out there where you can work as teams to rethink processes more effectively. We're just moving into a very, very different environment. And, and, and even just for a bit of fun here, I pulled off some data that shows, um, you, know, we, you know, these are automation suppliers across the global 2000, right? Um, and unsurprisingly, you've got companies like UiPath still dominating an emerging market, uh, Blue Prism, you can see in there, Automation Anywhere, Pega. But then look at this, you've got Microsoft um, who acquired Soft Emotive uh, a year ago, just over a year ago. You've got SAP who acquired Contextor a couple of years ago. They're now they're providing these RPA tools, companies are using them all of a sudden. So we're getting this mixture of best of breed, elements of emerging product suites, these types of things that are really changing the way that we're all operating. So without further ado, I, I do want to hear a bit from Jamie Dobson, who's going to get into our cloud native conversation and, and why this does matter. Thank you, Phil. It's nice to be here. <clears throat> nice to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> what does WTF mean again? You can say it, can't you? Uh, World Trade Federation. Very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think Elena should say it. There we go. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> if she doesn't know, she can't. It's... No, no, no. I've got my own version. What the Fruit Loop? What the Fruit Loop? <laughs> very good. Uh, what is cloud native and why does it matter? Um, it's not what you think, Phil. That's for sure. Do you want to? Do you want to roll me onto the next slide? So this is a story. I'm sat here today in London. So first of all, thank you very much for having me, uh, HFS, and hello to all of HFS's uh, guests and regulars. It's really nice to be allowed to come back after my first podcast. I was quite flattered to get a second invite. Um, and the team at HFS have been brilliant. So thanks for having me, and it's nice to meet you all. I'm sat today in the city of London, um, you know, where I work, and I don't, I, you know, I live, I live close by. And all around us all, are all different companies, financial firms, uh, retailers, some large, some really, really large, you know, mid, medium size, mid, mid size firms. And when we talk about cloud native, we always talk about Tolstoy. Uh, all of great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And of course, when it comes to cloud native, it's all about a stranger coming to town. And this is the problem. So all of the things that Phil mentioned earlier uh, about automation, uh, a full stack, best of breed. I, have, I hadn't heard that for years until you just said it, Phil. Um, all of those things, we know about them and we know we can begin to adopt them, uh, but we know they're painful. So we don't do it, which is normal. And unless there's an existential threat, most people don't think about moving to the cloud or they think it's something they're gonna do in a few years time. But unfortunately, for everybody around the city, there is a problem. There is a stranger that's coming. And that stranger will either be an upstart, a digital challenger that uses cloud native to come and eat your breakfast, to come and steal your business from you. Every single bank in London that tried to go digital failed, as far as I can tell. And yet Starling Bank, using cloud native technology processes, and of course the mindset, we're able to build a bank in one year and they now dominate that space. One year, get your head around that. Now, the second type of competitive threat that people are worried about are the large businesses. What happens if your biggest competitor goes cloud native first? And of course, the classic story here comes from the Netherlands with ING Bank. They went to the cloud, they went early. And in doing so, they won the battle for users, won the battle for talent and left everybody else locked out. So if you're competition goes first, they're going to get the jump on you. And then, of course, there's the third stranger, the one that nobody ever sees coming, and that's this. What happens if one of the tech giants decide to come and play in your space? So all of this pressure is on us to go cloud native. And that pressure was already there 12 months ago, but then, of course, the COVID pandemic hit, and all of a sudden, uh, people were, were threatened existentially from a different area. This led to many, many people moving to the cloud, becoming cloud native. And it's a simple, it's a simple explanation. When we're under recessionary pressures, we have to learn to do more with less. And of course, the cloud and cloud native lets you do that. Next slide, please. 
So the stranger is coming. The question is, are you ready? Next slide. If you take a look at this matrix, this is known as the cloud native maturity matrix. And you will see an overlap with the model that Phil shared earlier. And the problem is, for most companies, is number one, the stranger's coming. And number two, we think that we can beat the stranger by changing our architecture. So we say to each other, hey, we've got client server and we've been running Java and other applications for years. All we need to do is package this stuff up and chuck it on the cloud. And then of course, people are extremely shocked when the cloud provider, whether it be Google, Azure or Amazon, send you back a bill every month for 50, 60, 70,000 euros, pounds or dollars, wherever you might be sat right now. And this is shocking. And that's because you've gone to the cloud, but that doesn't make you cloud native. What you've done is you've packaged something up pretty ineffectively and those inefficiencies were previously masked by your own data center. But now you're running in somebody else's data center and you pay for that like a commodity and therefore you get a bill every month and the first bill you get is pretty shocking. So what we think of with cloud native then is a combination of the cloud, but also how we provision our applications, how we design them, but also how we collaborate. So cloud native works best with high levels of automation and high levels of collaboration. Teams, squads, departments are allowed to do their own thing. So the way we operate open source out there in the real world comes into our organization. So you might be sat there thinking, well, we can do a bit of cloud native, no problem. But are you an experimental manager and leader? Are you able to let go? Because if you can't, you will hamstring all of your own efforts. So what we've come to see uh, in the last seven years that we've been doing this and through all of our different studies is that cloud is, or cloud native is made up of the dimensions on the left. And if you're to get to the maturity on the right, you need to think, fix many things simultaneously. Nobody in their right mind would do this unless there was a gun at their head. And of course, the gun is the existential threat from all your competitors who are already doing this. Next slide. How can we do this properly? This is a good question because most people do the following. Out there, we've got two types of leaders. I mean, not everybody falls into these two categories, but many people do. You've got the incrementalists, the people who like to move step by step, small changes, continuous improvements. Kaizen is what the Japanese call that. There's nothing wrong with this. As the CEO of Container Solutions, my life is all about incrementalism. But every now and then, an opportunity or a competitive threat comes that's so great, you need to do something radical. So incrementalism will not help. Then, of course, you've got the other type of leader, the macho leader, the bullish leader. And actually, this leader is very good at avoiding criticism by doing something that nobody else dares do, namely something massive without taking the risk out. And the problem is when you go to the cloud, you go big early then all of a sudden you'll go small quickly. So quick and bullish ramp ups lead to uh, embarrassing uh, and costly ramp downs. So the secret weapon or the takeaway from all of this is as follows. You've got to treat cloud native like any other business project. You've got to systematically strip the risk out. So starting on the left, you mess around with some experiments. They don't cost too much. The benefits start to come. When you've got a feel for what you're doing, you move into phase two. A little bit more spend, a little bit more experimentation before finally a much larger spend in phase three. There's nothing new about this. I'd love to claim that I invented this, but I did not. It's from the 60s. This is gap analysis, risk analysis, and a little bit of uh, upfront thinking. And in stage three, when the odds are stacked in your favor, that's when you can go big. So if anything, cloud native, this is the, what you need to take away. Cloud native is complex. Don't do it unless there's an existential threat. And if you have to do it, do it like this so that you increase your chances of success. And that is my introduction to cloud native. I do look forward to some questions and some debate later. And I will now hand back to Phil and the team at HFS. Thanks, Jamie. So how does automation fit into this conversation? Um, so without further ado, I think we should hear a little bit from Elena on 
um, the implementations that are on-prem and how they're making that shift or can they make that shift into a cloud environment? Thank you, Phil. And thank you, Jamie. I thought that was um, interesting and insightful riff on uh, what the hey, hey cloud native actually is. So Phil, the question you posed is how does automation fit into the cloud native conversation? Uh, and in my opinion, based on lots and lots of research, qualitative, quantitative conversations with enterprises, lots and lots of HFS survey research, lots of conversations with tech providers and service providers. I think we've determined that the answer to that question is that automation, particularly business process automation, uh, it doesn't fit pr very well into the cloud native conversation yet at all. Um, it should, but we're just not there yet. So, which brings me to this slide. So it's a bit of why, why do we not see more automation in the cloud? And this has been one of those pursuits that over the last several years, um, we've included in surveys, we've included it in all of our conversations to say, hey folks, um, like, let's look at the sort of the, the darling of business process change, uh, RPA technology, folks that are, are running and managing automation initiatives within global 2000 enterprises around the world. Um, what did, what's, your, what's your cloud strategy? Um, oh gosh, we don't have a cloud strategy or that's being managed by IT. Those are very, very typical responses that we actually get, that we, we tend to get. And so what we've learned is that um, for, again, that distinct technology that is RPA, that roughly about 95% of the RPA implementations are on-prem today. And it's not because everyone has a, a desperate want to continue to um, go forward with uh, server-based approaches and on-prem-based approaches to how they're automating, automation being something that's ostensibly meant to be um, pushing you towards digital. We talk about it as though it's inherently transformative, um, but the way that we're actually implementing it is on-prem. And why is that? Because so much of what we're automating is actually on-prem. When we look at the, the, the penultimate poster child for business process automation, uh, it's, it's expanded, but the, where it started and where it continues to, to be very, very popular and heavily utilized is it within finance and accounting um, uh, functional silos, sometimes within shared service centers, within uh, global business service operations. There's a lot of uh, business process automation taking place within finance and accounting. Uh, and the systems that they're typically tapping into are in many cases um, old legacy ERP systems uh, and other types of, of specialized systems that are inherently on-prem. And so when you go to take that stride, uh, and, it, and it's been a wonderful advent of business-led automation saying, you know what, we're going to do some of what Jamie was talking about. Hey, let's, let's test this out. Let's do some pilots. Let's do a proof of concept. Okay, we can bring this in. We think it feels transformative, um, but you know what? Anything that we need to touch, anything that's tied into this wonky set of processes that we've developed after we poured ER, ERP cement into our back office 20 years or so ago, well, we've got lots of manual processes. Let's use uh, RPA to help us with those. So you got a really gigantic focus on on-prem and anyone who's been fighting the good fight to do business process automation over the last five years or so, that's your reality. And so what I hear from a lot of enterprises now about, um, are you gonna change that? It actually becomes part of a, a bit of a painful process, but there is hope. And that's what this data on the slide is actually about. So in 2020, and I will say Jamie's um, um, reference to the stranger coming to town, I think the stranger that we're all most familiar with at this time um, is good old COVID-19. That perhaps shouldn't have taken anyone by surprise, but it sh certainly did and lit a fire under many, many enterprises. And so of the various things we all were trying desperately to do in 2020, one of them, of course, was let's tell the future. And so being a research organization, one of the ways we try and tell the future is we do what I referred to before. We do lots and lots of research. So this is uh, it's actually a special treat for all of you today. This is some uh, yet unpublished data. So you get some fresh and tasty research vittles from courtesy of HFS. Um, so we did this in Q4 of last year. And one of the things that we were asking enterprises is, 
Uh, to what extent is your leadership pursuing the following operational strategies um, in this current environment? The current environment being the, the COVID stranger, so to speak. And so what's interesting is what rises to the top is, hey, what we're contemplating, or as our, our scale, our legend shows, what we are pursuing aggressively above anything else is leveraging automation as the catalyst to modernize legacy business practices. We'll expand that and say even just straight up legacy business practices and legacy tech. Uh, so this is both aspirational. This is perhaps the driver to, to push us forward, the, that so-called stranger that, uh, that was and is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but for those of you who have already engaged in this journey, um, you perhaps feel like you're stuck on prem. And so it's a bit of that sort of call to arms of, as you look forward at, and as you think and as you attempt to be thoughtful about how you can push this ball forward, how you can actually do what this first data point says, use automation as that catalyst to modernize legacy business practices. You need to also be strategic about where it's getting done and what your intentions are. So Phil, if we could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to talk for a moment about intentions. Uh, this is a very fancy chart I created, which I affectionately call the bottomless BS chasm. Uh, I have no idea what's similar to WTF. I'm not completely sure what BS stands for, but I think we can come up with some ideas. So as we've looked at what's being automated today and the reasons behind the automation, uh, what we've learned is that while you hear a heck of a lot of, like lots of folks dropping the T word, transformation. Um, there's lots of automation, business automation being done um, all in the quest for, for business transformation. But when you really peel back and look at a lot of these initiatives, uh, we reckon that maybe about 80% of them are actually in the quest for doing things cheaper and faster. Part of what, Jamie, you didn't actually use this word, but through your whole narrative of describing what cloud native is, the part that was really resonating with me was a big part of your point was, is definitely not just the technology. You got to change the people, the process, the culture, your data strategy to be able to yield some of these results. So our observation with something like RPA led automation, for example, is that it's done in the spirit of trying to make things um, transform, to do things better. But the reality is, is that there's not enough actual change going on. It's essentially taking many of the same processes that, that you've had, you've implemented, that you built off the back of that the ERP cement I mentioned before. And so it's sort of sprinkling RPA in and calling that change or calling that transformation when it's really just essentially doing things the same way you have done just with a, a new sheriff in town, which is RPA. And so we refer to that on the left as now value. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with now value. Now value is awesome. This has been in some of my conversations with uh, the investment community about why they keep giving UiPath big bags of money, for example. Part of what they say is, because dang, Elena, they're really focused on now value. And a lot of that is helping legacy tech and, and those associated processes and all kinds of process debt um, stay relevant. It's literally like a bit of a digital veneer until some sort of future tech intervention where um, your apps, application, enterprise apps will be migrated to the, the cloud. Your data will be um, cloud nimble and ready to be used to bring intelligence and help you automate your, your workflows. Um, and what we're really trying to strive for, and we think about what is true transformation, this is what we're calling, this is not cloud native, but what we call native automation. Uh, when you've got your house in order and you have your data in a format that can be utilized, your enterprise applications are in the cloud and enable, that allows you to do what both Phil and Jamie uh, alluded to before, which is it allows you to create new workflows. It allows you to change your processes and update them, make them intelligent, make them self-healing in many, many cases. That's the true transformation. So really the point of this slide overall is that you just need to be particularly in this, this what we call the new dawn as we are looking to the post-pandemic reality of 2021 and beyond. Um, I, I think of it as well as sort of the digital dog years um, that strangers come to town and really want, we really, really feel the fire and we want to change, but just be very focused about what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and if it is cheaper, faster, you go with that, you own that because it's really, really important. But just be clear that transformation doesn't come without change. Uh, next slide, please, Phil. And, and just taking this home, I mean, this has been something we affectionately call the flashlight slide. 
but I just use it as a, a way to, to, again, be very intentional about what you're actually trying to impact. And then just read my headline there. Tech is only 10% of the journey to native automation. You can do, and this is part of Jamie's message as well, which is why we feel there's a bit of sort of simpatico understanding of the world between container solutions and HFS, is that tech is magnificent and it is such a, a catalyst to uh, making strides to achieving digital transformation. But it's like, if you go through from left to right here, piecemeal automation, you, you go through your steps and strides to learn how to use all these different technologies. And then you realize that by coupling them into something we call the triple A trifecta, bringing together really powerful change agents of automation plus elements of AI uh, and smart analytics to be able to um, automate the flows, um, let machines lead, let them self heal, and then tell you what they've done through, auto, uh, through analytics. Um, getting there, that starts to be a, a, a pretty impactful stack. Uh, but you really don't drive that throughout the, the organization. You don't get to that cross-functional collaboration where these same tools are, are really baked into everything that you're trying to do. Uh, and the, the automation can flow easily based off, again, your data and your applications being in the cloud. None of this can happen without the good old, like Jamie said, he's using a model from the 60s. I'll go back to the early 90s and the good old golden triangle of people, process, uh, and technology need to work together. And we'd say here at HFS, we say the new elements to that are data has to be a first class citizen and it needs to be perpetual change management. And it's not just IT change management, it's not just organizational change management, it's ongoing perpetual change that impacts the people, the process, the tech and the data. And it's, and it's a continuum because it needs to be a continuum. And so that is a variety of views on how automation um, fits into cloud eventually. It is indeed on a collision course. We just need to be thoughtful about how we get there. Phil, I will hand it back to you, please. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, so we're starting to get the links between automation and cloud. I think that's been pretty successful, but um, in terms of how we're thinking this through. But what about progress in terms of actually acting against what we know, I, you know, I think we spent a decade and more um, talk, building great theory um, behind what we could do with new emerging technology in the cloud, but we didn't do a lot in practice. Um, and so what, did, what does progress actually look like? What is, um, someone said to me the other day, it's basically um, 2030 now, everything happening now is what was gonna happen in 2030. It's just happening right now. So, so, so what is progress towards taking 10 years and, and rewinding it to today uh, look like? So Joel, could you uh, kick that off? Sure, thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, and then uh, I'll start off, unfortunately, there's a bit of a Debbie Downer. I think, uh, you know, progress really looks like a mixed bag of aspirational journeys, as we've talked about, but they're weighed down by reactionary incrementalists. And, you know, being new to HFS, I, I kind of reflected back on my years at Microsoft and something that was important that was said to me uh, by Steven Sanofsky at the time. And he said, you know, show me an organization's org chart and I'll show you how they deliver their products. And we see that time and time again about why companies really struggle with moving from digital transformation to cloud native and, and to what's next after that. And, and this slide right here, this data point right here that just was a piece of our research that we did in, in the latter part of 2020, just paints that as clear as a picture. We were asking folks, you know, what are you going to do? This is business and technology leaders split nearly 50-50 in Fortune 2000 organizations. How does, what, what captures what you're doing right now? And they said, we have to invest in digital initiatives because of COVID-19. We have to do all these things because they make sense to us. But then you look down at what was their least, the least thing they were prioritized on is that we need to change our business model. So they're saying, we need to do a lot more with digital because COVID's hit, but they're so afraid of change. They're so afraid of changing how their kingdom and their organization and the culture actually works they're not gonna take this opportunistic time to really focus on, is your business model still relevant? Are you doing the things and operating in ways where you're sharing resources, sharing data, and rethinking how you can actually deliver value to your customers, 
to your partners and to your employees as you move forward. That scares me. And, and that should be the call to arms to everybody on this, on this call, in my opinion, is to really drill home the discussion with between business and technology, but how you're gonna to work together to use this burning platform, which is obviously a priority, to really rethink how you're delivering that. Jamie gave some great examples. So we'll come back to those in the q and I'm sure. But you know, if this is the way we're gonna go about things, the incrementalists will win. We will, we will teeter at the time, too afraid of the risks and the change it will cause, and we'll lose this opportun opportunistic moment to really change. Next slide, Phil. Next slide, Phil. And, and this uh, really drove it home to me because in that same survey, it was interesting because we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into becoming cloud native. There's a lot of effort that goes into digital transformation. And there'll be even more effort going into what we call cloud dynamic, which I'll talk about in a second. And again, business and technology are not aligned because when we ask those same leaders, who would you turn to for advice in, in moving your systems from on-prem to hybrid or to cloud? These are the answers that came back that were ranked. And it's clear to me right here, I mean, it just jumped off the page at me. The business leaders are still looking at things like, we want partners that will help us save costs, help us provide resiliency and drive outsourcing. They're very focused still on the digital transformation world of the last decade. Whereas the technology leaders are sitting there going, I need, I, obviously my business partners aren't talking to me about what they really need. So I need advice from people that can tell me what is changing in the markets, what's changing with customer needs. I need real business advice, but they're looking outside their organization. That's wrong. They should be addressing this together. And you know, I purposely use that Dilbert and, and his IT partner there. Both of them looking bemused. There's a total disconnect. And that's the big, you know, what the French being here in French Canada, um, it, it will be my WTF uh, analogy there. This is a, a big challenge. Uh, it's also a big opportunity if you are a partner, because you should understand when you're sitting down in front of, you know, in front of the business and technology teams in these large organizations that they need different things. So there's great conversations to be had about driving change in meaningful ways, recognizing that these two, and you know, these two cadres of individuals, your business leaders across the business silos and your technology leaders across their own, own technology stacks. Uh, have different needs and there's different ways that you can be addressing that. Next slide, Phil. And why is this important? Why is it important to recognize that right now we are facing a true opportunity to change, but we have to be willing to embrace because at HFS, we believe, you know, we've gone through a period of digital transformation. Over the past decades, we put in place things and we adopted solutions like SaaS. We looked at, you know, how do we move some of our contextual components into the cloud like Jamie and Elena and Phil spoke about earlier. Earlier, But these were all things, these were baby steps, but they enabled fundamentally our ability to rapidly change our business when COVID hit. Uh, when 90% of your workforce was suddenly not in an office, working outside your firewall, bringing their own platform and environment basically you know, into work every day because they were on Macs instead of the office PC. They were on their tablets. They were using, you know, some third party um, broadband system. Uh, so you had to secure, you had to drive collaboration, you had to engage. Tremendous opportunity to leverage the insights that we've learned about how people use data, how people change the way they work. That's the workloads and the processes that they needed to get their jobs done, to basically do the things their customers are paying them to do. These are all the great impetuses that lead us to cloud native. But I would add one, one last thing as we're looking at this. Cloud native isn't the destination. As Jamie pointed out earlier in his slide, it's a big part of the journey. But if you're not thinking two moves ahead, much, much like you would do to play a game of chess, you're gonna miss out. And you're just gonna basically take the technology debt that you tried to get rid of in digital transformation. You're gonna to be too quick to basically cobble things together and call it cloud native because you'll have licenses with various SaaS providers, you'll have macro services, micro services, you'll have hybrid cloud, public cloud, you'll have all these different environments that you will have adopted and, and you'll have process debt again. And the big challenge, again, that I would throw out is, you know, focus on how you don't create more technology debt, focus on what you're gonna do is gonna create technology wealth. And as Elena and Phil both chimed in and a lot, a lot is 
data is key, automating that data so your people who are becoming fundamentally digitally fluent, um, both on the business side as well as the technology side, use that information so that they can create the teams, create, ex create the processes, create the workflows that they need. Because again, processes is a big part of cultural change. It's so important to think about how we're still using a lot of the processes that we, our companies devised in the 1980s and 1990s, we've just digitized them. Cloud dynamic and the latter part of the cloud native will see those fundamentally change because people will unleash the real power of their data and be able to move forward. And then lastly, you know, looking at the future, it's, it's really the next slide, uh, much like Elena's flashlight slide, Phil, if you can advance that one, is, is looking at what's going on. And uh, that stranger comment that Jamie made really struck home with me because it speaks to how fast you can be disrupted by a new bank, an, a tech company deciding they can move in and disrupt your space. And look no further than what's going on in the financial services marketplace. Apple, Google, PayPal, micropayment solutions all over the place. Uh, banks are terrible for basically delivering products based on their work silos and not sharing tech and knowledge and data across those silos because the investments just aren't there. And so what we're seeing is you know, a lot of folks are using different platforms for investments, different platforms for their your retail banking and checking accounts, different platforms for um, commercial accounts, uh, and different platforms, even, hey, Starbucks, for putting money on it to using that as a transaction and wealth management system. So there's tons of disruption coming. Those strangers are here now. And this is sort of a, an abstraction of, of who's playing in that space. And you can see those tech companies, the telecommunications and the professional services companies. They're digitizing and, and they're, they're going to both advise, they're going to work with, and they're going to disrupt all those other sectors that are still, you know, stumbling along in the digital transformation part of the journey. So again, thinking about where that's going and how you become cloud native uh, is very important. And I'm just going to close with the last slide and it, it hopefully it scares you. Uh, Elena and I were talking before the thing. She said, Joel, this scares me. How are you going to explain this in two minutes? Well, I'm not going to try to explain this, but what I am going to say is when you're thinking about this journey, if you're on the business side, don't put all your, your uh, eggs in the basket of the business analyst team. They're important. They're so important to understand what the business needs and what the requirements are and how you go to market. Um, but like their, their twins on the digital side, the developers, the people that will write the code, manage the applications, move things off off-prem and into the cloud. These are very, very important folks to have on this journey. But really the NOAA to your arc is gonna be the architect and working with partners can help you understand what you wanna achieve and what your environment needs to look like because it is incredibly complex with the systems you already have and need to migrate. And it's incredibly complex with the choices that you have to build those solutions on in the future as Jamie spoke about earlier. So the technology architect, the cloud architect, is somebody that needs to be at the table when you're thinking about how your business is gonna operate in the future. Otherwise, you know, that flood is gonna sweep you under. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Phil. So I guess I can take this question and punt it off to some of my colleagues. Sorry, I, I, I had my mute going there. But... <laughs> <laughs> But I'll give back to you then, Joel. Yeah. Oh, it's a very expensive question, Joel, and maybe we can ask you it now, um, but it's how can we stop addressing the symptoms and tackle the root problems? Well, I mean, I would go back to that one of the very first things I said. You know, look at your org structure. Look at how your company is structured, has structured itself to deliver its products and solutions to market based on how it was delivering those solutions, likely in the 90s and early 2000s. It's that org structure that basically creates the ability for each of those silos to innovate by themselves or together. Leaders are going to have to basically make some hard choices around how, they, you know, how they're investing in technology, how they're investing in how they share data and, and how they rethink how they should be delivering uh, innovation or, dry, or rewarding innovation that promotes uh, both business, business and technology teaming together to innovate both in terms of their processes, but also on the fundamental solutions that people pay them for. Because 
I mean, we can't make any bones about it. The only reason we're all in business is because our customers are paying us because we're providing a valuable service. And my argument is, if you stop providing that valuable service right now with everybody being transacting on the cloud, they can easily move somewhere else. Okay. Jamie, Elaine, anything to add to that? I'd love to get Jamie's thoughts on this, just to, to bring your voice back into the conversation, Jamie. What do you think? And just so we're clear, you're on mute, Jamie. All right, it's a comedy of mute buttons. All right, I'll dive in then. All right, so how can we stop addressing the symptoms and tackle the root problems? So some of the themes that I mentioned before, um, you gotta be really clear about what your objectives are. It's like, I just, I like to look through the RPA lens just because it's, it's such a discreet, um, intangible example of technology. But when you're just looking through that RPA lens, it's like I said before, there's been such a focus on, hey, we're driving transformation, but then anyone who's had an automation program going for a few years now, um, and you're, you're now sort of as we're in the digital dog years, as I mentioned before, and you want change and progress very, very quickly, sort of looking at your program and saying, you know what, have I really changed anything? Um, and again, the now value is wonderful, like I said before, but you need to be very intentional about what your objectives are so you can make sure that you are actually banging on the correct levers to get what you desire. And if it's doing things faster, cheaper, possibly a little bit better um, in the interim, why waiting for some other tech intervention? I think that's fine. Um, I think the other piece too is, I said it at the end of my comments, but I just wanna underscore, make no bones about it. Cloud and automation are most definitely on a collision course. I mean, just the, for, for any Global 2000 enterprise and beyond that we engage with, um, I think if you just ask the simple question, um, are you striving to be cloud first? Everyone will say, absolutely, there, there's, there's no question. So we know that in terms of where the, the future is going, um, that cloud is inevitable. Um, how we get there is what we're obviously trying to figure out. Uh, and as part of a, it's a little bit of a, the chicken or the egg, like the, the, the data that I showed before from one of our studies, um, where it had automation as the, the catalyst for um, legacy, uh, modernizing legacy business practices and technologies. Um, I mean, just looking right at that is, um, we see that automation can be the catalyst, um, but you can get more done fundamentally if um, your um, applications have been migrated, if your data is in a format that can be more useful. So automation can be the catalyst um, but it can also happen the other way around as, I mean, as both Phil and Jamie mentioned, we've been on a cloud journey for the better part of a decade, but it's gone essentially from, um, hey, let's reduce our infrastructure footprint to more of a, let's modernize our applications. Uh, data's always been there, but it, it's, it's getting a bit more love. I think we've all tried and perhaps IBM the, the most, but um, really making data something that's, that's sexy and, and worth everyone's time and attention um, in terms of its, its value and its link to artificial intelligence and, and cognitive capabilities. It perhaps is, <laughs> is the best shot data has is, is really permeating um, what everyone is actually doing. So in any case, just the, to round out my answer to this question, Cloud and automation are definitely on a collision course. And so back to what you can do is that as you're going forth and, and you're perhaps you're uh, within, maybe it's a, a siloed function within an organization and you're pushing forward with your, your business process automation initiative, um, I applaud the effort. Again, be very focused on and intentional about what you're trying to achieve and think about what you could do to perhaps not just perpetuate the on-prem approach and really push it to the cloud because there are, there are more options than you've ever had, than we've all ever had. Uh, it looks like we've got Jamie back now. Um, Jamie, would, would love to have you weigh, on, weigh in on this particular question of addressing the symptoms and tackling the root problems. What do you think? 
Well, first of all, apologies for vanishing. My, my, I was locked on mute on the Zoom, but I'm, I'm back now. Um, this is, this is a very interesting question, it's because, and it's timely in the sense that I'm currently, I've been doing some research there this week and last week about, you know, of all things, the industrial revolution and the electrification of society, and what I took away from that is cloud native and what we're trying to do now, large scale distributed programming with, you know, the proper use of data. It is technically an epic, epic thing to do, both at a societal level and for each individual organization. Now, what that means is we are going to fail forward. So the question is, how do we stop addressing the symptoms and tackle the root problems? I, I think we've great difficulty. And we have got a, a, a newsletter, you know, it's called WTF Cloud Native, and it's, it's meant to be a bit tongue in cheek. But the reason we wrote it is because this stuff is so complicated. So until we understand the problem, I think we're always going to struggle to solve it. And I would like to see a sort of mass leveling up of how we educate ourselves. And that's on the technology side. And then on the psychology side, you need to have leaders and managers leveling up and trying to truly understand what it means to create. Um, the world of business in the last 30 odd years, you know, with a few exceptions, is about, you know, share buybacks, shareholder value, quarterly reports, and none of that leads to innovation. So we have lost that muscle. We know how to conserve our businesses, but we do not know how to innovate anymore. And I think until, until those two issues are tackled or begin to be tackled, uh, we are never going to get around to doing this properly. Not at scale anyway. Yeah, and um, I think I'll just add in here about data structures and, um, you know, this all gets back to data at the end of the day and how do we get the structure of the data and the governance of the data in the right place um, to be to be effective. And, and that's the start of this whole journey. It's it's figuring that out and then, and then figuring out how do we make a, make a shift from on-premise to... Um, you know, to sort of work work from anywhere scenario that's effective. And uh, clearly you can't just move overnight. Many businesses can't do that. They don't have that luxury. Um, and uh, after many, many years, they're still trying to figure out how to make how to make that shift. I mean, um, I mean, Joel, while we've got you here, what's your view on what actually has to happen now to to make companies take some of the pain uh, to achieve to achieve this is it they just literally will not be competitive anymore it's it something that forces them into because you know we got forced into work at home and it forced us to use zoom and and now I'm, it's it's now we are so used to using video technology we're like hey this is pretty cool stuff like we probably would have never got into using this technology until 2030 right like then we were forced to so it feels like even today when we need to be in the cloud, it will still feels like something is holding companies back from making that final move. Is it because they still figured out how to somehow function without being fully in the cloud? I mean, I was speaking with the CEO of one of the RPA firms the other day, and he literally said, between you and me, I've seen companies with the most disastrous operations and they somehow still bumble on, they still somehow survive. I mean, is that literally it? Companies are just continuing to drag around these horrific back ends and just not make the transformation? Or do you think we're now at the time where there's no choice? Well, I would hope that um, we, were at a, we were at a period where there's no choice, but we always have choices. Uh, I mean, I, I think, Listen, Phil, to me, the biggest challenge is cultural change. We have leaders that are, are balancing the needs of customers, employees, and stakeholders. They're trying to mitigate risk uh, from an optics perspective. They're looking at quarterly earnings, sort of long-term earnings. This fundamentally drives a certain type of attitude that I talked about earlier. Um, if you continue to promote leaders that have that same sort of tendency up through the organization, uh, and make it hard for those that really want to innovate and drive change. Those that want to change will leave and start their own companies, which will then eventually disrupt you. Um, so what we fundamentally have to have is, is leadership step up and recognize this is the pit ultimate moment. We have proven in the last few, well, now basically 12 months, that we can do things fundamentally different. Uh, but it'll be so easy to slide back and just, you know, 
take our wins where they are and then try to go back to operating the way we were doing beforehand. I make it a challenge to everybody to think differently, push the edge, leverage the fact that this has created opportunities, ideas, and teams between your business and technology leaders. Don't let it slip back to the way it was. This will mean we'll need to rethink how the org structured, what jobs we have for people, but companies will come out better if they're willing to take that step. And those that don't, we'll probably enjoy lumping along for the next decade, but I guarantee you by 2030, those that have made the big commitment to change will be the ones winning uh, the market share and the accolades of investors on Wall Street. I'd just love to add quickly off the back of Joel's comment, because what it's reminding me of is something I wanna make sure we get across on this, because I think it, it was touched on in everyone's comments, which is, Back to the, the, the allusion to the stranger coming to town, I had said, well, I think the biggest stranger for all of us has been the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the biggest mistake that anyone can make is thinking that once we, we, we finally um, vanquish the, the pandemic, that we go back to normal, that it doesn't exist anymore. Look, look ahead. Everybody look up and look to the future because that's what is necessary at this point. There is no going back. Of course, they say never waste a good crisis, don't they, Elena? Channel that Churchill, Jamie. I mean, if you look back over the last hundred years in the United States where you are, you know, the, uh, the, the Depression, FDR, the Second World War, all of these crises led to epic changes. And I think what we've got to ask ourselves as business leaders is this crisis is upon us. What changes would we like to see? Um, and I think Joel's dead right. The people who make that choice and ask that question, they'll be winning in 10 years. Uh, and, I'm, and the rest, I'm afraid, will not be. Yeah, I mean, uh, last thing I'll say is, you know, COVID has created the, probably the biggest global disruption short of a world war that we've experienced in, you know, going on 60 or 70 years. We should leverage that to accept and master the change that's in front of us, to, to, to rethink, you know, what will the roaring 50s of, of the 21st century look like, which will be the roaring 30s and sustainability, the new world of work, um, uh, a digital native and digital DNA in our culture will be part of that. And, and those that make that, that leap will be rewarded. Hey guys, we're at time here, but because we started just a couple minutes late, I wanted to, uh, we've been attempting to answer some of the questions coming in through the Q&A throughout, but Jamie, we've got a specific one for you. I'm wondering if you might just take a minute to touch on, which is, what are your views on cloud native tools versus third party? Uh, essentially, are native tools as good or better uh, as they're embedded within the cloud provider? Um, just one of our participants looking for uh, a point in the right sure. direction here. What do you think? No problem. Yeah, I can give a quick steer. The tools provided by the cloud providers will be very good, often better, but the choice is a business one. Because once you've gone all in on one particular cloud provider, it's going to be very difficult to move. So, for example, if you're a startup or a scale-up, you might not care about the choice and you're just happy to be moving quickly. If you're a regulated organization and you do not want to get locked into, example, uh, Amazon's cloud, you might ask yourself serious questions about consuming their full stack. Fortunately, many of the other tools available uh, uh, to buy or commercial tools are fantastic. And all of them are usually, you know, the best ones are supported by all the different clouds. But if you go back to my slides talking about risk analysis, you need to sit down at that first period and ask yourself these questions. How portable should we be? Do we care about lock-in? What is our regulatory framework? And build yourself up some nice experiments that will answer that question for you. And it might be that some of the tools you can, you can consume off the cloud and other tools, for example, monitoring, you might like to keep that separately. So those are those questions you can ask uh, right there up at the beginning of the process. Super, thank you for that, Jamie. All right, I know we're, as I mentioned over time, we're starting to see a, a fall off. Um, but again, to all of you who uh, came to join us today, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Uh, to Jamie, to Joel, and to Phil, uh, and to always to our behind the scenes uh, folks that are making the magic happen. Uh, Andy Day, thank you so much. Uh, everybody have a fabulous rest of the day. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you. <laughs>